Today is October 1st, 2008. We're sitting here at the John Deere Collector Center, and we're sitting with Brian Holst. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing very well today. Thank you. Great. Um, well, it's really a lot of fun to sit here in the Collector Center with you and get the opportunity to talk with you. Um, we'll start out with the real easy general questions, so we'll start age day for Okay. Um, 44 years old. Um, born uh, August 14th, 1964. Jesus. <laughs> uh, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Iowa City, Iowa. Okay. Um, now, I think from your bi biographical form, it seems like you grew up on a farm. Yes, born and raised, uh, lived on a dairy farm uh, in all through sc uh, high school and college. Uh, it was a family dairy farm, very small in comparison to today's standards, but uh, uh, milked between 40, around 40 head of ca uh, Holstein cattle, uh, so we were quite busy. Uh, had 120 acres of row crop and I rented additional more as, as time went on. Uh, we're just about 200 uh, toward the end. So it wasn't a large farm, but just a, a, a very fun, you know, family farm. Oh, great. Um, now, of course, you had your mother your father there. What about any siblings? I have one younger sister, young one's younger sister, and she's uh, five years younger than me, so she didn't uh, uh, get into the farm work like I did because by the time she was ready to uh, help out along the farm. I was more moving into the college years, so uh, I wasn't around quite as much then. Um, now, what about your grandma and grandpa? My grandma and grandpa, um, they they farmed the same grounds uh, that we farmed. Um, like I said, it was a family farm. Uh, our family, uh, or my dad's family, settled this area in 1852. Uh, bought some farm ground from a gentleman, and the farm ground is still in the family. Uh, it's, it is farmed by a family member, a cousin right now is farming that ground. Um, so we've been in the area uh, quite a long time. Uh, my daughters would have been the fifth generation, I was fourth generation, uh, to farm that ground. So. Now do you know um, where your grandfather came from? To... Uh, my grandfather was born here in the States, here in Iowa. Um, his, grandparent, or his parents came from the Holstein Schleswig area of Germany. Um, and my, the, the woman that he married uh, came from that same area she was actually born in Germany, but was raised here. Uh, as an infant, they moved. So. That's interesting. Um, now, what about like aunts and uncles growing up? Did you have any aunts and uncles had, had quite a bit of aunts and uncles. Um, both sides, my mom's side and my dad's side, both farmed. Um, opposite ends of the county. But, uh, uh, so I got to cover a lot of territory when I was a young kid, running from farm to farm. Um, dairy farmers, hog farmers. Um, one, one of my uncles, along with hog farming, ran a corn shelling business. Um, so I'd help him on summers and weekends. Uh, we were always bailing hay somewhere. Uh, uh, that's all I seemed to do in my high school days was cut hay, mow hay, crimp hay, bale hay, and start it all over again. Because uh, we had the dairy farm, and we, we made a lot of hay. And when we weren't bailing, we were helping other family members. Uh, I still remember helping my grandfather bale hay, and he was in his... Oh, he'd have been in his late 60s bailing hay on his farm, you know. Uh, he had a few head of cattle that he played with, um, but uh, yeah, we were always doing something somewhere. Wow. Now, um, when you were very young, where did you go to grade school? I went, I took my entire uh, school through Durant Community School District in Durant, Iowa. Um, it's the same school system my father went to when he was younger. Like I said, we didn't move very far. Um, so there was a few teachers that taught dad that, I got, uh, had to teach me, um, so like I said, I started my grade school uh, in one building and finished at the other end of the building, you know, 13 years later. So how was that, having the same teachers as your father? Were you a little commiserate about teachers together? <laughs> well, later in life we did. Um, of course, there are some times I wonder if they compared me to my father, because mm -hmm. after many years of, of, of out of school and working in that hometown again later in life, I found out my father cut a pretty wide path at times. And I was the angel, uh, I'm thinking, but uh, so I wonder if they had their radar up looking for, you know, oh, there's one of them guys, so, you know, we know his family, you know, because all my cousins went to the same school I did. So, I mean, it was, it's a small, small German community. Um, everybody knew everybody. You know, you had uh, your, 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 hometown family names that uh, had been there forever. And uh, you know, our names was, was amongst those. 
we weren't the oldest by any means, but uh, we'd been around a long time, and people knew people who knew. Uh, you could never get away with nothing, you know. <laughs> I could do something at one end of town by the time I got out to the farm, my folks already knew. So, oh you know, you, you just didn't get away with nothing. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, going to this, to this small community school, were, um, were kids getting bused in from different areas? Or how was it? Yes, um, we had a small school. The, the high school had about 300 people in it, the kid, students. Um, so we were bused in from about a 10-mile radius, round numbers. Um, I was one of the more further out within the district. So uh, having other kids in my grade close by wasn't usually an opportunity. Uh, There's one or two guys that were in my class that we would get together once in a while. Uh, ride three wheelers, motorcycles, or go sledding, or something like that. Um, but it was neat. Uh, you knew everybody, obviously. Um, from when you're a senior, you knew the freshmen coming in, and chances are you knew their older siblings, or your folks know their folks. Um, you know, I graduated in a class of '64, and and I won't, probably want to say about 50 of those I knew from kindergarten on. So it's it's quite unique. Um, you had a nice tight circle of friends, you knew everybody, um, we all got along pretty good, so you got to, you know, so. Now it had to have been hard, you know, you mentioned in being in a small town, you couldn't do anything or get away with anything and then get home without, you know, it already getting there. Um, it must have been hard in school that way as well. Yeah, I mean, everybody knew everybody's, I won't say, you know, deep business, but uh, you knew what people were doing, kind of where they lived. You knew when they started harvesting, that was always a talk of uh, the farm boys. Um, you know, some of the city, the, what we called the city kids, the folks that lived in town, you know, they, they couldn't care less, but hey, you know, how's the yields doing? My dad says it's this, and, and of course, you know, the typical uh, uh, first liar ain't got a chance starts at a young age. Um, after watching our parents and uh, rib each other, we, you know, we started ribbing each other, and, and, uh, but it, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. You knew a lot of people. Um, yeah, word got around, but you dealt with it. You know? Now you mentioned something about you know town kids, and then I guess you could consider yourself more of a country kid. Yeah, I, I'm farm farm raised. Uh, there, we like to say we're uh, Iowa bred and corn fed, uh, or Iowa bred corn fed, corn bread fed, <laughs> Iowa bred corn bread fed. Um, you know, it was one of those deals. You know, the football team was a pretty thick bunch of guys. Uh, you know, we all ate well, we all worked hard, and, and uh, we had a lot of fun. We couldn't play football with a hoot, but, you know, uh, I'd put anybody up against us in bailing hay. Uh, <laughs> if they had a sport like that in school, we'd be in great shape. But, um, uh, no, we, you know, the farm boys, they kind of hung together because, you know, we didn't have, uh, you know, a real deep city. Like I said, it's a town of about 1,500, 2,000 people, and uh, a lot of this, our city friends, you know, the, the, the kids that grew up in town there wanted to come out to the farm and help out, and we always enjoyed it because <laughs> less chores for us and got to do it with somebody you, you like to be with, and we always liked to spend time in town because we thought that was a vacation. You know, chores there considered of uh, taking out the trash and feeding the dog, and, you know, we're used to, you know, feeding the hogs or, or uh, you know, feeding the calves milk on the dairy farm or running silage out to the cows, you know, whatever it was. So. Uh, uh, their chores were a little bit lighter duty than ours. So, you know, with such differences between town kids and, and farm kids, were there ever any, you know, conflicts? No. Um, you know, there are times when I think some of the farm kids were a little bit more jealous of the free time. You know, they could go out for other activities that, you know, hey, we got to be home to do this. Uh, baseball, you know, right in the middle of summer. A uh, little bit of, I won't say animosity, but just you knew it was there, but you didn't have a choice. I mean, you did what the folks said and you went on. You know, some of us did get to participate in a couple sports or a couple extra uh, curricular activities um, to broaden our horizons. Uh, my folks were very good about that. Um, you know, as I got older and into high school and I was never given a curfew. Uh, all dad would tell me is if you can hoot with the owls, you can crow with the roosters. In other words, stay out as late as you want but come 4.30, you're out in the barn helping me milk cows. And there was a couple mornings that lesson was a pretty tough thing to learn. Um, but uh, you, you learn, and that's part of the responsibility. Um, you, you learn to take responsibility for your actions, 
And if you wanted to stay out late one night and hoot and holler with the boys, uh, you just better make sure you're in the barn in the morning or you had the wrath of dad. <laughs> and mom was right on his heels usually too, so. So, um, you know, th that leads right into the next thing I was going to ask you about, which is chores. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to have tons of chores. There was plenty to go around. Um, growing up, you know, elementary, my chores were fairly light duty, basically uh, uh, after school. I'd get off the school bus, had a, a quick chance to get a bite to eat, snack, whatever, um, and then I was out to the dairy barn uh, feeding calves. Uh, you know, we raised all our own replacement livestock, so we had to feed calves. We had to bed in hay. Uh, we had hogs in the, when I was very young, so there was always something to do in the hog barns. Um, and if it wasn't for that, we were grinding feed for the for the dairy cows to feed them, or we were you know hauling manure, you know whatever it took. In the spring and fall, we were doing farm work. Um, I'd get out off the school bus at you know tender age of nine, ten years old, and I'd climb into a hundred horse tractor and spend three, four hours doing that before I went and did homework. You know nowadays that's probably not the most acceptable thing, but uh, you know my family, you know it was instilled in them that you grew up to work. Um, child labor is a good thing in their eyes, um, and I didn't get hurt. You know, I don't think it hurt my work ethic one bit. Um, I've been accused of being a little demanding to my kids upon occasion because I expect some chores to be done um, that don't maybe get done on time or or uh, to my liking. But uh, uh, I think chores is a, a very good responsibility builder. It builds character. Um, it, it it shows commitment and. Uh, you know, we, we were always doing something. And when we weren't working on chores, we were having fun. We were playing, building forts. Um, you know, we had, like I said, we had three-wheelers riding those around, terrorizing uh, um, the waterways and all the livestock or the, the wildlife we can scare up, pheasants and squirrels and, and everything like that. Um, so uh, there was always, always action going on somewhere. <laughs> if not, you made your own. <laughs> yeah. So which, which chores were the... Probably the best chores, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, was uh, feeding calves, uh, bottle calves. Um, I thought that was just mundane work because you filled the milk up, you put the bottle in, and uh, you watched them eat it and took the bottle and cleaned it. But later on, uh, I got to where I was missing that because my sister did take that over when she became eight, nine years old, and I was on to the, the more unpleasant task of you know, hauling manure, pitchforking it by hand. Um, that was always just a gruesome, gruesome thing to do. Just, you know, painful, had to walk, carry it. Only fun part was to get, get to drive the tractor to unload it. But uh, uh, so the more loads you did, the more tractor driving you got. Yeah. Um, but that was probably the thing that at the time I thought was pretty rough work, but that was pretty nice. I enjoy working with cattle, still do to this day. Um, there's nothing to me more satisfactory or satisfying than uh, taking a calf, newborn calf, um, watching it take its first steps, uh, nurturing it, and then raising up into a, a production animal, whether it be beef or dairy, and uh, you know you know that you've done something, you know, and it, it's a two two year process to get it to that point. So you get some ups and downs. You got some good things and bad things along with everything. So now um, you mentioned your sister taking over one of your chores. Mm -hmm. Were there certain chores that were for girls, certain chores that were for boys? My father didn't believe so, and he tried to teach both of us the same things. Now, um, some things were easier adapted to myself, some things were easier to my sister. Um, so each one, we, we kind of went off in our own specialty areas, and there are some things that I did ever since I could start doing chores. You know, um, when it came to uh, uh, vaccinating calves, that was my job. Uh, my sister could never get past the needle uh, aspect, which is fine. You know, it doesn't take long, and it's pretty simple. Um, there were some things that, you know, physically uh, she couldn't do. Um, you know, when you break an animal to lead, I mean, it takes a pretty strong arm and a pretty, a pretty fast feet, so... She never got into that. And same with bale and hay. You know, she could lift some bales, but not keep it up on a 
day in and day out basis. So there were some things, yeah. Um, you know, did I learn to cook and clean? You bet. Uh, I didn't get out of that. Of course, later in life that turned out better when I was in college because I wasn't going to starve. I made sure of that. Um, so, yeah, we all had our areas of, of preferability and, and just physically we couldn't do some things. But we had an understanding on how each side worked and what it took because, you know, when, you know, she would stay overnight at her friends or I'd have a sports activity, um, you know, we'd have to pinch in. Everybody takes over a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, you know, just because you're not there doesn't mean the chores don't need to be done. And when you're in a, on a dairy farm, you're there morning and night. It, it, it has to be. So. Now, um, there's other organizations other than the schools out there. You know, yes. 4-H, FFA. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in any of those other farm organizations? I was very much involved in 4-H. Um, I started when I was nine years old, and I took it clear through um, as far as I could. I, I think it was up to age 19 at that time. Um, very active in it. Uh, was uh, active in the club in the county organization. Uh, I held every office on the club level at one point. Uh, I was on county council. Uh, I did try to run for state council, but I didn't quite make it. Um, but had a lot of fun. Met a lot of wonderful people, friends I'm still uh, in contact with yet today from that, that whole event. Uh, know people from across the state that I got to either show against or uh, uh, when I, we went to camps or uh, uh, citizenship uh, trips, you know, got to know people from other counties, um, and still have built a, a lasting friendship with with a lot of those folks. So very much, uh, very involved with it. Really got me into to public speaking, or at least somewhat comfortable with it. So uh, I don't know if I'll ever be totally comfortable, but uh, it really opened up my eyes to what the possibilities were. If I had stayed on the farm probably wouldn't have as, as, as much confidence in some of my abilities in that respect. So uh, I think it's very positive my kids are involved in 4-H. Granted, they don't do the same projects that I did. I worked a lot with the animals, woodworking, that type of thing, to where they're more in the horticulture. Um, being I have daughters, they're in the sewing, the fashion shows, that type of thing. Interesting. Now, one of the other organizations Mm -hmm. uh, was your family involved in going to church? The family was not involved actively in participating in church on a weekly basis. We were uh, Christian, no doubt about it. But with a dairy farm, you know, you're there 5 in the morning until 8, 39 in the morning, and just so much going on. It, it just, I hate to say it never fit in, but it just didn't work right with the other farm responsibilities. Uh, Christmas, Easter, some of the holidays that way, yeah, we were there. Um, when we could attend some late church services, it worked out better that way. Did attend when I was younger a lot with my uncles who didn't have, or aunts and uncles who didn't have the livestock responsibilities. Um, so they'd take me along for Sunday school, situations like that. So it was very much uh, there. It just wasn't on a weekly participation basis. Since, uh, since we've, I don't have any livestock, yeah, we, we attend church every Sunday. I have a great uh, community group there uh, that is just wonderful. Yeah, and you just led to that point, the next point, which is that um, church isn't always just about going to church on Sunday, but there's also, you know, different community organizations and things surrounding around that. Was your family involved in those things like you are now? Or? N not as much, no. Mom and Dad, they stuck pretty close to the farm. I mean, they never, you know, they didn't get to college. Um, they, they stuck pretty close to the farm because their understanding to make uh, things work, you put everything you had into that project. Uh, in this case, it was farming, and they made a livelihood of it. We, they raised a family of, of four on 120 acres, which is kind of tough you know, in the late 70s and 80s when farming wasn't that good. Um, so their, their commitment was to the farm. Uh, they were committed to us kids uh, broadening our horizons. Uh, that's you know, the 4-H, the church activities the school activities, so uh, they helped us become a little bit broader in our knowledge of the world, and, and they made sure that uh, we had those opportunities. Well, that's, that's great. Um, now, you went to college. Yes. At one point, and what, what did 
did you end up going for? Well, originally I started off, uh, was never really that keen into books. Um, I like being outdoors. I like working with my hands. Um, was fairly decent in the shop programs at the high school, so I decided to continue in something in that area. Started off thinking I could be a, or I wanted to be an automotive technician, working on cars and trucks. So I took a year schooling of that, actually a year and a half. Um, graduated from that program. Figured out that a, a man of my size working on a, a small compact car is not the, the, the best suited for my abilities. So uh, I enrolled in a ag tech program and to where I learned to be a, a mechanic on farm machinery. Uh, went to college for two years for that in Ottumwa, Iowa. Graduated and uh, uh, was a full-blown trained mechanic, supposedly, and was ready to take on the world. So I uh, started my world out working with tools, um, still work with tools, um, not so much for a livelihood, but uh, still enjoy working my hands, being outdoors. Uh, anything with a motor and a steering wheel, you know, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> Now, um, why didn't you stay on the farm? When I graduated from high school, um, it was 1982. Uh, the economy was still pretty rough. 1979, the farm economy just flopped uh, here in the Midwest. Uh, it was tough. It was real tough. So dad said, you know, son, you're uh, Of course, me as a young 16, 17-year-old kid said, I ain't going to college. You know, I want to stay here on the farm. I want to milk more cows. So he said, nope, you're going, going to school. So that's when we decided on the, ag, or the uh, automotive program. Local junior college, could still stay at home. Dad still had a milker, um, so I could milk at night, earn a little extra income uh, for gas money. Um, once I figured out that, yeah, mechanic is what I want to do, but I wanted to move on to the ag uh, mechanic side. That was in a, a community college that was two and a half hours away. So... Uh, once I made that announcement to Dad, and he was all for it, <clears throat> he made the determination that he's not going to milk cows anymore. So one week before I left for college for the Ag Tech program, we sold our dairy cows. He wasn't going to milk them all by himself. He was losing his hired hand. So uh, that was a, a tough day for everybody in the family. It was a tough decision for Dad because he'd been milking since he was 15 years old. Um, and he was at the point where he had some health issues, uh, nothing serious, but he could tell the way we were milking, it was not a modern setup by any means. And uh, um, he figured it was time to cut back for him um, and concentrate more on just the, the row crop farming. He went back to hogs, raising some more of those. Um, so I left for college and come home once or twice a month to help out with the farm work in the falls and the spring. Uh, the rest of the time I lived in the dorms, so uh, it was... Uh, it was a change for everybody. You know, I was on my own, uh, officially, I guess. And uh, mom and dad were without uh, the daily chores, so they started doing a little bit more traveling, you know, to see friends and relatives close by, so. Now, um, after you graduated college, what did you do? When I graduated from college, it was 1985. Um, in the ag industry, that is when uh, there was a huge merger between uh, case manufacturing and international harvester. So when that merger hit, there was a severe con consolidation of dealerships, and there was a lot of unemployed tractor mechanics out there. Whether they were from Case or whether they were from International, they were on the market looking for jobs. Well, any dealership around was looking for seasoned, quality mechanics, and as a young, recent graduate, little tough market to break into. Um, there was a, an alumnus who went to the same college I did who, was, who had a standing order for any mechanics coming out of this program to come talk to him uh, down in Texas. So I figured, you know, I'm not attached. I have no, limited responsibilities. Um, so I decided to take him up on the offer, went down, had an interview, uh, was hired. And uh, upon graduation, one week later, I was in a U-Haul heading to Texas. I uh, went to work for a uh, uh, manufacturer down there, uh, not a, but a dealership down there for Alice Chalmer. Um, I was hired on to be their combine technician, and I spent uh, two and a half years working for that dealership in the rice fields in Texas. Wow. So 
uh, I got I got a rude awakening. It's not row crop farming <laughs> like we're used to here in the Midwest. So what's the, what are some of the differences? In the <sighs> Rice is a very abrasive crop. Um, a lot of parts wear uh, a lot faster than what they do here with corn and soybeans. Uh, just the conditions you work in is extremely unique. Uh, rice takes a lot of water, so there's a lot of water around. The ground down there was a lot different than the Midwest black soil that I was used to. There's a bottom to everything down there. So when things got too wet late in the season for like planting, they would flood the fields and work them with standing water. The type of dirt down there was, was very uh, sticky, gumbo-y type. And once it got onto a tire, it really never pulled off well. But with water, it acted like a lubricant and it would peel back off. Um, so they would work the ground with that cut the water off, the, the ground would level out, and it was ready for seeding. Um, there again, if it was dry enough, they'd run in with drills, like we're used to seeing here in the Midwest, and plant the rice. If not, they would uh, uh, fly it on with an airplane, seed it by air. And then they'd flood the ground again for the crops, or the rice to, to start growing, cut it back off, let it get up so high that in the rest of its life it stayed in water, until it's ready for harvest and they cut it off again. Um, working with that, the levee system that they had to use to keep the water in certain paddocks um, was unique, was very unique. Uh, it's it just a different way of, of farming that I'd never thought I'd ever be exposed to. Uh, I understand corn, I understand soybeans, you know, but uh, rice was different. Uh, different needs, different requirements, different harvesting techniques. So uh, it was it was definitely a, a, a enjoyable experience. So being a combine technician in this totally different, you know, agricultural area, what what adaptations were required of you for that? Well, mechanics are mechanics. A combine works a certain way. Uh, granted, on a combine uh, for rice, you ran different threshing cylinders. Up here, we run what's called rasp bars and concaves. Down there, they run spike two cylinders. Um, little different, unique, uh, a lot more aggressive down there. So I had to get used to what those looked like, how those worked. Still same basic principles, just different application. Um, again, like I said, higher wear components. We, we replaced a lot more flighting and auger pans and such like that. Never saw a corn head when I was down there. So, you know, uh, we had one farmer try corn, but he combined it with his grain platform because he wasn't going to spend the, or make the investment on a corn head for 50 acres. So it was, it was unique, it was different. Um, some of the other aspects I had to get used to was the heat. Uh, it was incredibly warm, very humid, working with all, those, all that moisture around there. Uh, it took a little while for me to get adapted to that. Um, some of the, the insects down there were a lot more aggressive than what we had here in the Midwest. Uh, tremendous amount of mosquitoes, fire ants, I mean, fire ants is something I've never heard of until I got down there. Um, but it's, it's, it was neat. It was fun. A lot of great people I met down there I still keep in contact with today. Um, you know, the food was fantastic. Uh, those, those folks can put on a heck of a spread. You know, me being out of college, I was a, kind of adopted by a couple families down there, and I don't think I spent two nights in my own apartment. I was always over at their house. Um, running around with their kids. Uh, I mean, I was still young, under 20. Uh, so we had a lot of fun. We really did. Good, good. Um, how did you get back to uh, Illinois in this area? Well, being from the Midwest, you, know, you get homesick after a while. I mean, I always thought winter was a terrible thing. But you get to missing the seasonal changes down there. It, they have summer and they have fall. That's all they had. Uh, up here we got the four seasons. You miss the changing of the, the leaves. You miss the snow. I never thought I'd say that when I was young, but uh, you miss the snow. And, and I wanted to get closer back to my folks. Uh, they were on the farm. My sister was gone by then, uh, out on her own. And they were doing all right, but just, it's family. You, you want to be back home. Uh, so I started working my way back into the Midwest. Uh, I got close. I was in western Iowa for a period of time working out there at a, a John Deere dealership. That was my first John Deere dealership that I worked at. Uh, again, combine technician and tractor technician. So uh, when the opportunity came for me to move back to the eastern side of the, 
the state, I, I acted upon that. And that landed me back home uh, where I could help dad on the weekends, in, in the evenings, if he needed help setting augers up, moving equipment, uh, fixing a barn, whatever it was, I was there. And that was important to me. Cool. Now, um, starting farming with your father, and then, you know, working on this machinery all the way to now, you've seen some pretty drastic changes, I'm sure, in farm technology and farm machinery. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those things? Sure. Um, my earliest rem remembrances of farming was probably in the very late 60s. I mean, I was three, four, five years old at that time, sitting on the tractors, uh, hearing the two cylinders off in the background, because they were still around. You know, it was only eight, nine years since they were discontinued, so they were still very much a part of, of farming. Watching the mounted pickers harvest the crops, uh, seeing pull-type combines harvesting soybeans. Every, you see the real progressive farmers running co uh, actual self-propelled combines and uh, going, you know, wow, that'd be the way to do it. We had pull-type equipment. Uh, we were never, like I said, on the leading edge, uh, but we had equipment that worked well. So watching that come on, seeing the first combine come onto our farm, you know, that was something big, new, and exciting. I've uh, never seen anything that you could uh, pull into the field and just unload into a wagon. Um, it self-contained. That was something unique for us. When we bought our first tractor over 120 horse, you know, that was huge. Just, you know, we'll never need anything bigger. You know, how, how could somebody need a, a 200 horse tractor? Uh, that's for those folks out west where you had fields that were, you know, acres and acres to where our little fields were 30, 40, 50 acre patches. Um, watching machinery go from four row equipment up to, you know, eight row to 12 row, then to 16 row. You know, that was just phenomenally huge. Um, watching guys with combines start off with two row heads like we had and then the four row came along shortly thereafter but those guys that went to six, eight row, twelve row heads you know, that, those were big time operators and just to see that massive of machinery being able to maneuver through the fields where just fifteen years ago they were two, two, uh, two cylinder tractors you know eighty horsepower tractor was a large chassis tractor making several trips back and forth up the field, pull, pulling four, and four bottom, maybe five bottom plows. You know, now we're pulling nine bottom plows. We're pulling, you know, 30-foot chisel plows, 26-foot disc. I mean, that was big-time farming back in the early 70s. Um, then when the first articulate four-wheel drives showed up in the, in the neighborhood, you know, those were something you just pulled up alongside the road and just watched them go back and forth on the field. Just in awe at the size and the horsepower that those things could uh, produce and what productivity they were given the farmer. So it, it was unique. And along with that, you had uh, advances in grain handling, drying capabilities. You know, we went from picking corn on the ear, drying it in the cribs, shelling it um, with a portable sheller that you hired to come in, to storing your own shelled corn in grain bins, uh, drying it on the farm yourself, uh, unloading it, grinding it, you know, uh, just all those those uh, techno technology advancements um, came onto our farm in the late 60s and early 70s. So uh, it, it was kind of phenomenal. And probably the biggest thing that helped, I think, farmers in general is just the hybrids, the seed hybrids, the herbicides, the insecticides. Um, really made some tremendous advancements, uh, especially in the late 80s, middle to late 80s, uh, with all your GMO uh, genes that were introduced uh, has really made farming uh, quite quite large productivity results on the same acres we've been farming for years. So. Interesting. Now, you worked in a dealership in Texas, you then worked in a dealership in Western Illinois. Mm -hmm. You know, being in a dealership, I'm sure you heard, you know, the, the little rumors of, oh, he's got now got this kind of seed or he's buying this kind of tractor. What, what was it like working in a dealership? It was unique. Um, being raised on a farm, I knew farming. I knew how to plant. I didn't know probably the science behind, okay, what soil test results do and, and how to apply that. I never got to that. It was always dad's responsibility, uh, which I did learn later on. But you know, watching guys make adjustments to their combine, how to better uh, 
prepare the seed beds to get that better crop, uh, what they were using for uh, nitrogen capabilities. Some guys were into microbial uh, genetics, or not genetic, but microbial uh, ad uh, adaptations to their soils. Um, some people called that on the fringes. Some people thought that was the greatest thing. Uh, I was first introduced to um, uh, low impact farming uh, where you did a lot more organic. You didn't use the herbicides and insecticides like the other farmers did. Uh, what kind of results they got. Uh, you, you always heard in the coffee shops what was going on, but it was neat when they would come in to have their equipment worked on. You had a chance to talk to them one on one. And you got to learn from a very diverse uh, um, group of people. You had some folks that were incredibly well educated uh, in the sciences. Some people were very well educated in financial background. Other people never made it off the farm. They, some folks never got through high school. Eighth grade graduation, they were back on the farm. They were usually the older generation, but still, um, they were not dumb by any means. They may not have the worldly knowledge of, of corporate finance, but they understood finances in their own way and learned how to apply it to their situation. And a lot of them were very, very successful. So you got to learn a lot of the old school thoughts to some of the new school thoughts, and you picked and choose what you wanted to learn and retain uh, to use later on in your life. So it, it was unique. It really was. That's interesting. Now, how did you get from the implement dealership on the West, in Western Iowa to the collector center here? Sure. They're both John Deere, but how do you make They're that? John Deere. Um, it, it, <laughs> it was unique. When I was in college, part of the curriculum was uh, on-the-job training. So again, like I said, times were still a little tough in the farm economy. Uh, dealerships were pretty conservative, so uh, I had the opportunity to work at a salvage yard for my on-the-job training. Well, this salvage yard dealt with John Deere only and stuck more toward the two-cylinder, the pre-1960 tractors. And he had a repair shop in there, and we also sold salvage parts. So I kind of cut my teeth working on two-cylinder tractors, taking them apart, uh, putting some pieces back on, that was reserved for the guys who knew what they were doing more so. I was there to learn, so I helped a lot. I got into painting tractors uh, for this individual. And I got to where I understood them. Uh, we called it talking, talking two-cylinder. So uh, when I graduated, like I said, I went to my other dealers. And whenever a two-cylinder tractor would come into the dealership, all the mechanics said, hey, I worked on enough of those, I don't want to work on any more. And I said, I know how to work on those. You know, let me work on them. I feel comfortable here. Uh, this way, I know what I'm doing 100%. Where the newer tractors, I understood them. And as time went on, I, I got to like working on them. But they were new, they were unique, and the other guys wanted to work on those. So I got to do all what they didn't want to do. Low man on the totem pole type thing, and that was fine with me. So t as time went on, the dealerships I went to more and more, the older guys were retiring. And... It got to, when you work at a dealership, you build a following of customers. They know what you're capable of. They know what you can do. And word of mouth spreads, and one thing leads to another. And pretty soon you've got new customers coming from other dealership areas. Maybe not their whole business, but, hey, I heard you can do this. I heard you're good at it from so-and-so. And they bring it to you. And it makes you feel real good. And that's just not two stores. That's other areas, too, Baylor Mechanics, Combine Technicians, so on and so forth. So eventually, uh, I got known for that in, in some of the areas, and I had an opportunity to move into the parts department. Um, I, I realized that mechanic was tough. Uh, your hands were never fully healed. They were always nicked up. And uh, I thought, you know, I better look at expanding my horizons before I get too old and not be able to. So I went to work in the parts department, and I really enjoyed that. Well, while I was working there, I ran into a gentleman who restored antique tractors and became good friends with him and we built up a relationship that I could find parts that nobody else wanted to look for or could find so again I built up a reputation of going the extra mile for that really obscure thing that somebody was looking for and as time went on we kept in contact and he ultimately was uh, part of the initial setup of the collector center and when we first started we were looking to sell parts and he gave me a call said, would you be interested in something like this? I said, sure. He said, well, you still got to go through all the processes. Nothing's a guarantee, 
but why don't you throw your name in the hat? And I did and ultimately got hired. So that's how I got to the Collector Center. So what do you do here at the Collector Center? <laughs> well, I moved from the selling of the parts to uh, uh, when this gentleman who hired me retired, uh, I took over his position as manager. Uh, what I do here, I'm in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, we are uh, actively restoring tractors in our back shop. Uh, I work closely with the technician back there. Again, still that mechanical mindset of mine, I can't keep my hands off the tools. Um, I always like to tell people, he lets me work down there until I break something and he tells me to go away. Um, but uh, I'm responsible for the finances uh, of the facility. Uh, ultimately, uh, all the parts ordering is run through me. I don't do the processes, but I'm in the uh, making sure everything is, is here, everything's paid for. Um, we also work with our licensing department on reproduction parts. Uh, we're part of the approval process. Uh, we're not solely in charge of it, but we're an integral cog of it. Make sure the parts are, are accurate, as close as possible. Um, we don't get into the uh, warrantable issues of, of, uh, of it being a, a good part. We're more into the authentic side, making sure it meets specs as far as dimensions, um, getting them as close as possible, because a lot of the folks in the restoration uh, business want something that is or looks very similar to original and that's very important because so many of these parts have been reproduced so many times they don't have the look of an original piece and we tr we tr strive to keep things as close to original in our restoration department and found that there were some items that could be improved and we wanted to work with those suppliers who were doing that uh, to help them uh, make a better product uh, that represents this company.